It gives me a great pleasure to be invited to this series as a speaker, and I'm attempting to share my screen now and uh, start the slides that accompany uh, this. Let's see if it works. I assume it does. Um, and uh, so I just wanted to uh, uh, give you some uh, some preliminary words on uh, on the scope of today's talk. Uh, so you see a title, and obviously I'm stressing the idea of regeneration for today's uh, title, but I realize that what you uh, will hear most of all is concerned with the uh, twin concepts of playfulness and the epistemological role that playful, the nature uh, nature's ability to, to play uh, has to do in Kepler's science. So there is that side, uh, just, for, just for reason of time. And um, let's see, I can't really, okay, so this goes down. I, I hope you can, it's uh, big enough uh, for you to see. So the, uh, the outline of today, I, I conceived today's talk in two parts with a brief, uh, very brief interlude. And each of the two parts will conclude with some, um, some assessment. And I hope that uh, in, the idea is really to offer you what I see as a doorway. Most of what I came here to, to, to say, to share with you, is, uh, can be summarized as the, um, an inquiry on, into how Kepler um, uh, uses the snowflake uh, as an epistemic object. Um, and, and by that, I mean there is, that there is a process of uh, segregation of, a, of an object that is not scientific, it's mundane, it uh, has a low tire uh, role to play, uh, not unlike milk, uh, not unlike ink, uh, in the way that was discussed, for example, by uh, recently um, by Adrian Jones. These are objects that uh, go through a, a process and they acquire, uh, or in some cases, lose um, connections to magic or to alchemy or to another uh, sort of natural uh, uh, philosophical uh, connections that they have. So I see the snowflake as one of these uh, objects. And I'm, I was prompted uh, to this paper by a reconsideration of the correspondence between Kepler and Harriot, which as many of you in this room know, took place between 1607 1608, and I was struck by how, in the end, uh, Harriot ended up sending down to Prague as sort of tesauros of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, material on, on refraction, which was something to be marvel at, and Kepler indeed wrote to, to express just that, that he marvel at this, um, but then he also mockingly uh, admitted that he wasn't um, that he was aware that Harriot was pushing him into a direction which he thought had to do with alchemy and, and uh, atomistic theory. So today's talk, in a way, starts from there as a, as a pretext because I see uh, Kepler uh, uh, as seriously, taking seriously the part of the Aristotelian in this, in this dialogue between him and Harriot. And I see that most of what he has to, uh, most of the reasons why he um, builds the snowflake as a new epistemic object, a kind of puzzle of natural philosophy of a different kind, has to do indeed with, um, uh, with a polemical intent against atomism and against uh, precisely the kind of connotations, the alchemical connotations that Harriot uh, wanted him to impress through him through a dialogue that uh, admittedly was about optics. So this is my personal uh, sort of uh, what prompted me to work on, on some of these materials. And there were also other factors um, th there's been a couple of very interesting papers, one by Rebecca Zorach uh, and another one by Jonathan Regier, who started to uh, look at stars and, and uh, crystals and snowflakes as well as something different from what has been seen in the past. Um, it was no longer a court, an entirely courtly um, enterprise on Kepler's side, but it became something that enabled a new realignment with artisanal epistemology, with mineral extraction. And that was also influential to me because, as, you, as I hope you can see uh, in parts of my paper, I'm trying to um, to do exactly that, to, to claim that there is uh, um, much to do, left to do, in terms of mineralogy and extraction and the idea of nature regenerating itself in Kepler in these years uh, between the last part of the century and the first 10 years of the new one. Um, and I think that my view defends a certain sort of Aristotelian view of this uh, spontaneous generation that you will see later on about 20 slides from now. So um, let me begin with the first part on the polyhedral thesis. In the, in the 1590s, Johannes Kepler was teaching mathematics in Graz, 
which he would leave in horror at the end of the decade, heading for Prague in the aftermath of a religious persecution. Kelper's own predicament was softened probably by his upper Austrian Jesuit acquaintances. As it transpires in his energetic correspondence with his mentor, Michael Mestlin, whose advice is sought more than ever for both theoretical and practical purposes, the young German professor saw the sectarian rift and the necessity to reform astronomy as a discipline as two sides of the same crisis. The strategy of layered ontologies that he developed in the context of that crisis should be understood both as a way of nesting solids and of bringing together knowledge from different domains. This was already evident in Kepler's first substantial publication, the Mysterium Cosmographicum of 1596, which introduced the polyhedral thesis. It came to fruition 15 years later in another morphological work, a lesser known, the Nives Exangula on the six corner shapes of snow. Both works demonstrate a playfulness that is more than just courtly etiquette and assembles a variety of epistemological and theological discussions already found in Lutheran circles, such as the natural light doctrine, the pattern of planetary orbs and the causal method referred to as regressus. Together, Mysterium and Nives Exangula defend harmony and geometrical concinitas, that is to say, architectural neatness, and cosmological homogeneity, as he later remarked, were challenged by atomistic theories and rehabilitated infinitism. Both of these works, moreover, are linked by explanatory devices. In the preface to both the Nives Exangula and Mysterium, Kepler uses fictional narratives of discovery, in Mysterium recounting uh, how in his leisure hours at Graz brought the revelation of a polyhedral thesis, namely that the number of planets are, and pro proportional distances between them could be represented and might indeed coincide with the five solids exposed in Plato's Timaeus, as well as in books 13 of Euclid's Elements. Introducing the Nives Exangula, on the other hand, Kepler adopted to, adapted to morphology another revelatory tale. He pretended that the intuition of the stubbornness of natural patterns came to him as he was crossing Karlsbrücke in Prague, contemplating the flakes falling on the lapel of his coat. Despite and beyond its groundbreaking features, Kepler's Mysterium should be seen as an individual contribution to a collective textbook of cosmology that had larger aims and notably neo-Melanctonian aids. Um, it was uh, uh, to repackage the Narratio Prima by the mathematician Reticus, which offered an abstract of heliocentrism reputed to be clearer than the one Copernicus himself produced. Indeed, the volume was shaped by collaboration and peer pressure at each stage of its production and dissemination. It was published in Tübingen by Georg Gruppenbach, the local typograph typographus academicus, that is the designated printed office, whose privileges and de facto monopoly function regularly in many other 16th century universities. Mestlin's agency and supervision in the project has had a recent reappraisal. He clearly stated that Kepler's polyhedral alignment would be enough to secure his fame, and he did not limit himself to validating his pupil. He also championed Kepler's rationalism as the touchstone of disciplinary reform. It was perhaps natural that Mestlin should have felt inclined to anchor an observational campaign on a man who was recognized beyond the threshold of mathematical greatness. The view of Kepler's Mysterium as a computational blueprint was shared by elite cosmologists, and the catalyst for transformation was essentially practical. The interactive montage and participatory folding of mathematical objects, which led to a literal cluttering of haptic models, similar to the 16th century German workshop. Flap prints and ephemeral build-it-yourself pages became a trend, and given both their availability and the tendency to move easily across media, nested solids were found on different material supports, including turned ivory. And used as implausible bodies, such as the Nuremberg Goldsmith Wenzel Jamnitzer's Perspectiva Corporum Regularium of 1568, uh, uh, on one of whose hatchings you see in a picture now and they are reproduced in our literature on this theme uh, often. Lavish and artful, this type of geometry used playfulness to materialize the possibility of allegory. In its visual lexicon, it was based on recreational discipline. There was carving, tracing out, rather than platonic remembering. 
Together with time-telling devices and other paper instruments, this versatile polyhedra became, in the words of Susan Karschmidt, experimental substrates in the maker's workshop. Fairly late in the conception of the Mysterium edition, the tubing and printing entourage suggested to Meslin, who was mediating between Kepler and Gruppenbach, to produce a visual materialization of the book Cosmology. It is hard to specify who was actually responsible for such a visualization. Our documents allow us to say at best that it was an ongoing conversation between the printing atelier, similar to many others in the history of science that involved invisible assistants or actors. Regardless of agency, the decisions to pursue this course of actions led to Tabula 3, which is, as you know, one of the most recognizable images in the history of astronomy. You see it to the left. Uh, I cannot attempt a full review of the scholarship at, uh, for today. Andrews in 2017 denies Kepler's agency, he makes the tabula that you see an opportunistic move at the printer's behest. Uh, but in, in my view, he fails to present evidence that Kepler's organizational system is threatened or undermined by ludic metamorphosis, which is more similar to my own take today. I to a T, uh, more or less in the same turn of years, is correct about the mutual disciplinary borrowings, and she sees the cosmological discourse of this uh, woodcut, of this, uh, of this piece, as an intervention on narratology, basically uh, featuring fictional interlocking um, uh, grounds. There's also a new paper on J.B. Schenk on this. Uh, uh, Kathleen Crowther and, and Peter Barker recall the Augustinian tradition of reading in the mind's eye, and they note how this cosmic cross-section played a role in the pedagogical process of a genre, which they identify with the, the pedagogical genre of the sphera and the theorica. But coming back to my paper, by 1611, in the Nives Ex Angula, Kepler assumed similar visual skills as a prerequisite. Um, it, which makes it interesting that his initial reaction in 1596 was apparently non-committal. His position was frequently adopted when dealing with the printing shop, also accounted for his lack of surprise in seeing the standalone foldable insert. Kepler's cultural recognition that German polyhedral landscapes in Jamnitzer style were a kind of lingua franca of special thinking was well established. Over the years, Kepler would continue to draw on this perceived affinity. In fact, rather than opposing practical workshops to a mathematician's theory or speculating on a metaphorical trading between the two, as in the trading zone, the interesting question to me is whether playing with geometrical tools was mesmerizing for its own sake or whether it took on a higher epistemic and demonstrative function. Externalizing Tabula 3 in a busy populated instrumental practice made Kepler's Mysterium legible to artists uh, and workshop um, users. But if its familiarity and effective power were increased, what was the act of showing a geometrical crosscut of the cosmos? Was it also a feasible way of proving mathematical claims? This paper assumes first that there is a substantial continuity between Kepler's Mysterium and the geometrical extraction of the 1611 treatise on the snow crystals. And secondly, that while additional research is clearly required, the impression that arises from these two texts indicates that along with the novel definition of symmetry, some framework of a proof procedure also coalesced. And to the extent that it did, it was similar to the Hellenistic technique illustrated in Papus of Alexandria's Collectio. Namely, our data is given in the sense of being constructible. The best confirmation uh, of the first of these two theses or claims is Kepler's ability to move beyond the great disdain for playful presentation of mathematics. In large part, this is a result of his skill as a lawyer and a courtier, and his inheritance of the German workshop tradition, which may be summarized at best as a mixture of aesthetic and epistemic pleasure. As for the second claim, Kepler's fundamental law for analogies um, and geometry's ability to reveal hidden natural secrets, of which you see a, a, a famous and quite spectacular case in the optics in the first part of the slide, Kepler's love for analogy should also make us aware that geometrical figures were known uh, in Hank Boss's um, uh, second part of the quotation if they could be constructed. 
In other words, Greek problem solving involved a phase of construction that matches Papu's idea of apodeixis. And I'm suggesting this uh, uh, sort of view of apodeixis is very influenced by Revial Net's idea of what uh, this is in relation to uh, epideictic uh, rhetoric. So apodeixis and epideixis. Perhaps Kepler's brand of constructivism, if we can call it like that, might bring a useful counterpart to the Baroque marginalization of proof via folding and to the intrinsic variety of many different concepts of space recently studied by Friedman, Regier, and Vermeer. As a corollary to these reflections, moving again into the printing shop at Tübingen, it is important to remark that both Mestlin and Kepler relied on a traditional system of oversight fold-out sheets. Presumably, they both felt that the graphic use of thickness in the woodcuts was the best way to introduce the readers to the Copernican solution of the problem of having large gaps between the planetary orbs. Mestlin and Kepler continued to discuss and share revisions after the 1596 monograph was published. Their exchange is indeed remarkable for the heavyweight demanding geometrical speculation contained in it, uh, it was aided by diagrams, and what is equally in evidence is a taste for witty asides and etymological wordplay in Latin, whose sophisticated allure was arguably cultivated by both parties. So let me give you an example of this. In, the Mar in March of 1597, Meslin reviewed Kepler's opinion about the animation of the heavens, which he finds both subtle and dangerous in equal measure. How, he reflects, are we to avert destruction in our field of inquiry? You see in, in this quotation, sinimis extendatur, uh, sinimis subtilis sis, verio profecto, I'm afraid that you will bring destruction, yacturam, certe ruinam, uh, to the whole astronomy. How are we to relate Kepler's theory of the moving soul to the interdisciplinary methods of astronomy. The conclusion at the end of this quotation is that um, he advised his fellow moderation and confirmed that he had a half-hearted or languidus est meus ascensus, a half-hearted support. Usually, this passage is taken to translate Meslin's insistence about using astronomical theory sparingly. But to the erudite nuances, the erudite nuances do a great deal of explanation, as one can see in the expression of Meslin tepid approval. The adjective languidus is revealing and distinguished by a Lucretian overtone that you see on top of this slide. There is some evidence of an annotated copy of the Prutenic Tabule of 1562, printed in Tübingen and compiled by Erasmus Reinhold, where a marginal note, seemingly dismissive, uh, evaluates Copernicus as an indolent mathematician or languidus mathematicus. This is exactly the same language of Meslin. The comment has no date, but participated in a reception of Keplerian astronomy in Helmstedt at the turn of the 17th century. This precious occurrence suggests that even if Meslin's position on astronomy was not predominant in northern Germany, at least the term languidus continued to fulfill a high level technical role in cosmological debates. Kepler was right to suspect that, the, uh, that his explanatory narrative of the cosmos required the form of accommodation, perhaps a naturalization helped by more accessible sciences. This part of my, uh, of my claim, moreover, uh, has interesting uh, supporting materials in Stuttgart. I, I've seen many copies of the uh, tabule, the post uh, Tycho Brahe tabule compiled by Kepler. When they're used by uh, artisans, they do exactly this. They naturalize the higher points of astronomical theory through the mixed sciences. So you see, you see a sort of geometrical uh, adaptation of triangles and, and many other um, uh, features that uh, really make it more accessible. This is the kind of accommodation, naturalization that I have in mind here. Moreover, Meslin was correct in positioning geometry as a threshold of epistemic transmission across media. By design, the cognitive style attending to such a restructuring was twofold. On the one hand, Kepler must have expected or relied on diagrammatical representation which also meant that he co-opted mathematical practitioners and considered the artisanal epistemology of the German workshops. And he also trusted linguistic puns, on the other hand. There is little difference on these grounds between the youthful mysterium and the witty, the nivus ex angula. These two works epitomize skills and learning in a perplexing yet elegant gestalt and consequently spoke to courtiers and artisans alike. 
first, uh, I thought to just uh, then close this first part of, of my talk, the, the slightly shorter one, just by uh, sort of taking a, a, um, a, a more distant look. In the period in question between the first monograph in 96 and 1611, uh, the relocation of Kepler to Prague, it seems that demonstration models and foldouts, uh, of, of which tabula three, in a way, it is part, um, they had a shifting status. They had, they certainly had a value a, uh, as a commodity, uh, so they were exchanged uh, in in courtly culture and in larger republic of letters. But they also responded to Peter Ramos' uh, um, call for an astronomy without hypothesis. There is to say, there was a, an element in this um, that was meant to be a counter uh, counterintuitive to. The the Ramis call for an astronomy without hypothesis. Uh, this brings me to the next point, which is mostly what I'm interested here or, or more interested because uh, um, it seems that there is a lot of uh, uh, evidence that is, is just being um, brought back to light. For example, we know now that Kepler uh, signed a, uh, uh, um, a non-disclosure agreement, as we will call it, uh, uh, working with the clockmaker uh, Jos Burgi, uh, where they both were in Prague. Uh, so these are the years pr uh, immediately preceding the, uh, the treatise on the snowflake. So it seems that um, what I'm trying to do is to defend an alignment between Kepler science and artisanal epistemology, technologies of extraction, uh, as in mineralogy, and also despite a scholarly emphasis on the Platonic and Neoplatonic or, or Proclean in, in a case tradition, one sees a rehabilitation of geometry that actually, in my opinion, starts uh, immediately from Aristotle and from the uh, sort of a straightforward defense of where geometry was left after the acquisition of Sextus Empiricus. Now, I trust that not everyone would be on, on board with this, but I hope that the second part of this paper will show uh, um, a way to, to, to get, uh, to use the snowflake as a, as a doorway, as I said earlier, to kind of conceive a, a, a sort of natural philosophy of Kepler that is remarkable for, his, for its being not very platonic or uh, neoplatonic at all. Um, so uh, finally, let me just say that the tabula three, of which I, I just uh, used here, uh, perhaps only as a, as a pretext, but it definitely belongs to a, a larger, um, uh, a larger long durée. In terms of long durée, it belongs to this discourse, which is really tabula, uh, the way of using tabula. Uh, as a kind of a specific instrument that allows uh, simultaneous side. You can see at the, at the heart of this quotation that comes from uh, instructional, it's an instructional at the uh, back of uh, uh, Gerard Mercator 5051 astrological disc, and it says, simul uno intuito contemplabitur. So the author is spared uh, this uh, ethical wandering, meandering, um, and is allowed to see things at once, simul uno intuito. So I think that there's something about that that I think stimulates Kepler in, in a, certainly in a tabula three, but also uh, as we will see shortly uh, in the treatise on the snowflake. And I do take the point uh, that uh, what Kepler is trying to do in the in the smaller treatise is also to reflect on the ethical self-fashioning of mathematicians, and uh, in other words, to um, construct the readers as. Um, people who would be spared because of the ingenuity of the snowflake, they would be spared this, this kind of meandering and wandering uh, through, uh, you have this image of the silva, which is, is very classical, per multitudinem per immensam silva oberret. So the, so the aberration of these uh, meanderings are spared uh, by the ability, the instrumental ability, artisanal ability to seeing things at once. So let me go now quickly through my interlude. This takes us back to Prague uh, in a kind of circuitous round. This is the a map of the uh, uh, relocation of the Institute, the uh, Astronomical Observatory of Tycho Brahe out of the highland of Kven down to Prague. And the only reason why I, I brought this up, I made this image up with uh, using Palladio, by the way, um, is just to show you uh, one thing that seems striking to me. Uh, now, John Robert Christensen, the great uh, Danish-American scholar who worked on this relocation, 
um, uh, said that essentially when you get out of here and you lose patronage, especially the, the princely kind of money, uh, then what happens is that it is impossible for in, in many ways to reproduce the same level of sophistication because you get stranded um, in, in an environment that it is characterized for one thing by uh, disgregation at the state level, by wandering, by many other practical problems. So he describes the caravan of instruments and people descending down to Prague. But what I think it's interesting is that these uh, places that he touches, Rostock, Wittenberg, they really are replicating the map of the Melanchthonian Protestant universities. It's almost a, it's almost like a, it reads like a network inside out. So to me, Kepler moving to Prague to join Tycho Brahe's uh, relocated observatory is really an important moment because I, I see Kepler as being the the, uh, the juncture where the project of Tycho Brahe ceases to be an aristocratic sort of um, pursuit that needs a state support, and it becomes something that is uh, has a lot to do with the Melanchthonian system of universities. And I can see this uh, also following the epistolary exchanges. Um, um, Kepler writes incessantly to artisans in Wolfenbüttel at the same period. Uh, and so there is this kind of inheritance of the largest European database of astronomical tables that becomes a sort of study in contrast. Uh, and Christensen is very adamant that uh, this is a period of uh, forlorn, elegiac uh, sort of period in the life of Brahe. And he, and he actually makes the point that uh, the, the, um, the state of the observatory is not unlike uh, Einstein fleeing uh, the Nazis in Germany. Um, so it's very, very adamant about that. But I think that there is something uh, of, of, uh, of a different view that, that I'm more interested in primarily because I see this as a reenactment of the um, German university system. Um, so Kepler in, uh, in Prague, uh, he was hired uh, primarily as a philologist and as a lawyer, as I said earlier. He was to provide the head of the research institute a robust line of defense against the accusation of the imperial mathematician Ursts. He also had to respect a strict regimen of secrecy concerning observational data against which he fretted. Kepler's daring brilliance was obvious to Tycho Brahe, but in a household that privileged convivial erudition, his surly, exacting, theoretically eccentric behavior displayed a simultaneous lack of ease. This makes it quite significant that Kepler invested so, great, so much great energy in the playfulness of his epistemology. While his colleague Galileo artfully deployed a dialogic anti-scholarly rhetoric, Kepler's discriminating ear for exegesis, as one reader famously put it, translated an inner conviction that he was working at the end of times and should not completely remove the ties that bound him within and beyond the imperial court in Prague to an early community of natural observers and prophets even that he knew well, uh, also because his mother famously practiced herbal folk medicine. As Nick Jardine emphatically observed, playfulness and delight in riddles are central to Kepler's self-characterization. If there is a cognitive feature that remains constant in the various periods of Kepler's science, determining its thought style is the pleasure in the decipherment of a cryptic object of study. It is well known even heliocentric theory is an occasion to unveil ancient Pythagorean wisdom. Kepler's search for hidden archetypes logically precedes the articulation of their virtues in terms, in terms of harmony and beauty. In this respect, the aesthetic premium placed on simplicity is not an alternative to exper his experimental testability. Kepler wants his readers to be gratified by reading signs and tracking footprints independently from a theoretical gain. Indeed, his games and serious jokes are, to a preliminary extent, a celebration of the sense of Erasmian copiousness in the natural world. Objections against this approach were raised clearly by some contemporaries, for instance, reacting to the Astronomia Nova of 1609, based on a huge set of iterative calculations and precompiled tables, Peter Kruger, professor of mathematics at Danzig, applied to Kepler a typically humanistic accusation that was used against Aristotle, namely that it obscure, he obscured things deliberately. Kruger reconciled himself with Kepler's ideas once the Table Rudolfine appeared in print after the war in 1627. But his taunting of him as someone guided by mere guesswork actually captures the imaginative process that led Kepler to explore a new epistemological proof based on playfulness and beauty. 
Is the answer to Kepler's hidden archetype straightforwardly theological? Can they suggest, even if God is never away from Kepler, a simpler awareness of mathematical cognition? Answering this question requires looking into how much empiricism Kepler was willing to sacrifice to trust, for trusting potentially debilitating aesthetic parameters. His circumspect and geometrical approach to the snowflake jolts with the resources of playfulness and surprise. And with that, I invite you to follow me for the last uh, 20 or 25 minutes or so into the uh, snowflake. Uh, and the first part of this journey is entitled The Harsh Gems of Natura Naturans. The Nives Exangula is a small tract, almost of the same size as a doctoral disputation in the German academic system of its time. It contains little in terms of visual aids, although the woodcuts are organic to the exposition of the chosen topic. This is surprising in its own terms. Moreover, Kepler's treatise is by design inscribed within a logic of courtly presentation. It is, after all, a gift for the new year of 1611. The frontispiece of the Nives Exangula offers no particular insight into how its author will develop the theme of nature's playfulness or the Archimedean revival. In part, this effect derives from the fact that the treatise was conceived, materially speaking, as a gift and not as a mathematical textbook. However, entering Kepler's De Nives Exangula means identifying the modernity of its scientific rationality. The treatise fa fails to explain the shape of snow, though it is admirable in its account both of the honeycomb and the pomegranate as complex biological patterns. How should we conceive of this failure in light of mathematical beauty? Kepler writes that spirits taken as the creator semblances should be consistent with shapes rather than raw quantities. That's the first part of the slide. And if shaped, receiving patterns from solid bodies rather than surfaces. In a structural sense, well, we can meaningfully speak of this passage as Kepler's appeal to a mathematical reasoning grounded in aesthetic pleasure. A position was commonplace. Um, Apollonius in book three of the Conics aimed at a maximal surprise, or I quote, theorems that stretch belief. Archimedes Stomachion advocated a maximal medley presided by an Hellenistic idea of poikilia that presumably involved a hybrid of geometrical and calculatory techniques. Moreover, discussing mathematical beauty was also commonplace in Plato. But the context of the Nives Exangula provides compelling evidence that Kepler is not rehearsing a fully Platonist procedure in which the observer experiences an intellectual insight into the fundamental structure of the universe. He is counting rather on shared perceptions of a mechanism that is construed mathematically. At this level of consciousness, the Nives Exangula celebrates a geometrical object aesthetically. The symmetrical purposiveness of Kepler's snow assumes visual skills as a prerequisite, and also a cognitive acquaintance with how the beautiful can turn into the expl explanatory. Kepler's attitude is anything but dogmatic. He remains influenced by Plato and Proclus, and he systematically looks for a three-dimensional cause for every snowflake. And yet, he fails to capitalize even once on polyhedral particles as a way of accounting for the action of cold air on water. Like the Mysterium, the Nives Exangula is invested in testable mathematical models, but geometrical regularity at best is compared to synoptic illustrations of cosmology. You see this in the second part of the slide, the comparison to uh, synoptic illustrations of cosmology. This reminds that Kepler understood the creation of world system as the epistemic endpoint of a long development of courtly commodification. And when we turn away from the Platonic legacy, the theoretical oscillations within the Nives Exangula continue to be strikingly consistent. In a pivotal section of the treatise argument, Kepler introduces the idea of spontaneous generation. But he is certainly far from endorsing any Epicurean self-driven design or the Lucretian slogan of spontaneity as a philosophical freedom from theological burdens. On the other hand, he is not marveling at honeycombs and snow crystals with a stoic tendency to see in nature a lawgiver that invites men to just obey. A few lines later, Kepler concedes, at least aporetically, that it, the hexagonal shape may arise from a crossing of three diameters, which is a more traditional Euclidean view, or more, may have been six cornered right from the start. And this would be more uh, similar to Plato's innatism. However, he refuses to take a final position. 
All in all, the Nives ex angula is not a triumph of natura naturans, seen in Roman terms as a clever and unspoiled landscape. The microscopic subtleties are not preempting discussions, but rather setting up a phenomenological and deeply effective resonance. This would position uh, his early crystallographic intervention along with minor disciplines that he continued to practice in the shadow of wider pursuits, such as astrology, eschatology, or indeed mineralogy, to name but a handful. Kepler's mathematical pose is primarily an ethical technology of the self. This posture is informed by the value of precision taken as a currency in courtly exchange and by the symbolic capital of surprise. A mathematician seeks in the wake of Hellenistic Alexandria, a type of demonstration that astonishes, apart from being a legitimate hypothesis. In October of 1597, um, Kepler wrote to Galileo to express exactly this, uh, that mathesis bewitches. It is highly instructive that the 17th century reading community eschewed the utilitarian or the serviceable in favor of the variegated and the sophisticated. A hub of practitioners that is, would similarly prioritize a set of shared practices over beliefs, whether be them atomistic, neoplatonic, or even Copernican. The persuasion that surrounded proofs and Kuhnian paradigms was based on ethos, not strict reliability. It can be argued in greater detail that the Nives ex angula is a rich mosaic denying a firm conclusion via surprising roots. Kepler expected detour to be astounding in their own rights. Writing from Wolfenbüttel to Prague in July of 1611, the year of the treatise publication, Nikolaus Wicke excuses himself for his faulty geometry, which he says is due to self-training, and salutes Kepler as a master of demonstrations. The Nives ex angula as we can see here, foregrounded cognitive textures against the material turn in the Holy Roman Empire that relativized the gap between elite objects and daily material things and coincided with the social rise of highly mobile mathematical practitioners. To borrow a signature keyword from Hans Jörg Reinberger, uh, Kepler Snow gained the credentials to become an epistemic idea whose knowledge articulates itself in a succession of games and trials towards a new form of writing. This graphematic concatenation is best embodied in the genres enacted by Kepler, which are very counterintuitive. In the part of the treatise where he compares plants and snowflakes as radiating from an animating core, Kepler wittily muses that if Aesop adulteress Polyxena would have kept a bastard of spring, as she pretended to conceive from a snowflake. And a few lines earlier, Kepler maintains that the same form creating rationality would prevent natural shapes from being ugly or immodest. This is the longest of the printed marginalia in the text that is meant to explain with a citation from Greek drama that you see in the slides, uh, Polyxenus killing and the manner of her final collapse as told by Euripides. And Euripides says that even while dialing, she took much forethought to fall honorably. Kepler here is borrowing from an epistle 411 of Pliny, where the slaughter is a symbol of matronal restraint. It is stunning in precisely Hellenistic taste that Kepler annexed this grim Euripidean scene to a rhombic assemblage. He is here defending a notion of teleology through the somatics, proving once again that being a mathematician is about ethos and self-technology. Nature plays, but with a disdain for blatant gestures. Ordering its plot means concentrating a length on the beauty of its layered ontology. As I said, diplomacy and craft were central pillars in the conception of the Nives ex angula. The booklet was a New Year's gift to a friend, the Imperial Chancellor Johannes Matthäus Wacker von Wackenfels. It attempted to ground nothing ontologically, and as a result, it promised a geometrical speculation disguised as a protracted courtly riddle to the extent that Kepler successfully overturned the melancholic feelings that accompany the abstract intellectual of external bodies, he could do so not by showing a mathematization of physical processes, but because he simultaneously appealed to the late Renaissance tradition of the instrumental workshop and the humanist habit design, fashion, and play around bare geometrical features. This explains why he chose to place Bakker as the intended reader of the Nives ex angula. Taking our cues from epistolary exchanges, the chancellor emerges as sympathetic and cloaked by humanistic festivitas. 
For, for instance, the Toscan ambassador Giuliano de' Medici, writing from Prague in February of 1611, describes him as a persona singularissima in questi paesi. Wacker supported Epicurean infinitism and Giordano Bruno's radical cosmology. As for Kepler, he teases Wacker for their common friends should really learn to drink from the barrel too, and makes him an absent interlocutor in a searching letter of December 18, 1610, written to an anonymous correspondent in Dresden, in which Kepler is discussing convex lens making and comparing the opinions of Cardano and Scaliger on the birth of the printing press. In these slides, I just put uh, elements that indicate uh, Kepler's uh, manipulation of festivity, festivitas, uh, or uh, irony, uh, concerned with uh, Wacher. The multifarious traits of the Chancellor converged to a, char a stable characterization. Wacker possessed an exemplary polymatic erudition, which was a mirror of Kepler's own pursuits and nourished among the elites of their time. In addition, Wacker's expertise signaled the Democritean cleverness had become very desirable for rulers, scholars, and artisans alike. This, uh, I argue, may explain a great deal why Kepler wanted a courtly homo ludens to receive the Nives Exangula. His criticism of cosmological confusion, which went beyond Lucretian's swerve and back to his mysterium, was to be rule-bound and acceptably transgressive. It turned playfulness into a weapon, uh, a boomerang against those very Epicureans who define leisure as the founding ethos of their philosophical inquiries. Now, having reviewed uh, this section of the treatise, the section of the treatise in which natural clusters and plants are likened in their function as a laboratory of morphology, we are now in a position to try a bird's eye view of the Nives Exangula's execution. Kepler's primary aim was to fight the philosophical challenge of atomistic matter theory. Then it makes perfect sense that he spent the first few pages surveying a sort of doxography of the theories of elements and the birth of life. In this part, the author remains non-committal, despite open references to Parmenides and Plato. The witty remark that his reader delights in nothing justifies that such brief doxography equally amounts to nothing. But Kepler is not entirely dispersive either. He utilizes the narrative framework to set up two major books which inspired him to write about the snowflake. One is Archimedes' The Sand Reckoner, which determined a numerical upper bound for the grains of sand that fit into the universe and represented a typically Alexandrian fascination with impossibly huge number and the use of myriads qua myriads. The other book is Scaliger's Exercitaciones Esoteriche de Subtilitate, set against Cardano, printed in 51, from which he selects a specific chapter or an exercise to claim that even the smallest animal, a mite that burrows under the human skin, is not lifeless uh, in a geometrical conjecture. So crawling is not beneath having a soul and a spatial shape. Kepler must have had great fun in choosing Scaliger's hypertrophic animadversiones to introduce a prose epistle of noticeable brevity that ends with an amusing request for further research. One is similarly tempted not to take Kepler at face value when he casually insists that he's following Archimedes' read, reasoning to the point of being utterly confused. There is a valid reason why Scaliger's eclectic and multidisciplinary interpretation of natural science and the Sand Reckoner are interconnected. By combining the fantastically big and the fantastically small, uh, as Nets noted, uh, can a mathematician operate with the proper sense of size? We should be impressed that Kepler's selection favored this domain of impossible mathematics because aside from the fame of Archimedes among Byzantine and Roman readers, manuscript collections beyond late antiquity were geared toward plain geometrical work. And yet Kepler's exploration of weight and measurement, including the Nova Stereometria Doliorum Vinariorum, dedicated to gauging the volume of a wine barrel, a return to this vein of dazzling calculations testified by such Archimedean works as the measurement of the circle or cattle problem. Kepler made the most of the original Hellenistic setting of this tradition in the literary format. He imitated the impression of authorial control which he found in ancient exact sciences, and he frequently interspersed the Nives Exangula with personal remarks. The courtly Lusus pro provided him ample background to subvert the disposition of geometrical proof, and he suited Kepler 
well. As we saw earlier, this was how his mathematical voice and epistolary persona were localized by contemporaries set in, in the German academic environment. One notices extreme carefulness in Kepler, just an example, the doxography of natural element, uh, after the doxography of natural elements, the flakes of snow are described with a distinctive feather-like levity, which is actually taken by Leonardo Alejandro Alberti's choreography of Italy, a text which is widely sought after in, in the Library of Vienna, uh, presided by Hugo Blotius, among other things. Um, the author's vignette on the, on the bridge of Prague is fashioned after a famous satire by Horace uh, that develops absent mindedness as an ethical enclosure. You just need to, uh, to compare Dum Meditans Anxie on the bridge with the famous Ibam Forte Via Sacra, uh, Nescio Quid Meditans Nugarum. There is nothing metaphorical about finding rhombic tangles as an aesthetic archetype, given that testing their nobility of a polygon by inscription is a major leitmotif in Kepler's career. And yet he refuses to solve the issue of whether or not there is an idea of beauty or a teleological purpose. The priorities of this section are driven by geometry. The necessity to study or generalize hexagonal proportions and viewers this means that order and symmetry neutralize doctrinal tensions, even with respect to the forms and the legitimacy established by Plato on drawing on mathematical principles to explain physical phenomena. On account of these tasks, Kepler offers an investigation that takes much of the Nivea Six Angula, touching on the onycom gates, the loculi of pong grenades, and the regimentation of cold. This long excursus is supported by lateral woodcuts in three instances, and it leads to a purely biological comparison. Namely, what does snow have in common with other animals? The question is put in relation to habitat, gravity, and lack of obstruction. Kepler's presentation exhibits what Dennis Cosgrove called a growing apprehension of space and its intellectual mastery. And while Kepler looks at beehives through the lens of Roman Georgic poems, in some parts citing Virgil's expression, uh, in other parts, uh, uh, operating in an environment where bees are seen as ethical actors, part carpenters and part soldier, is adamant that in the case of the cells of pong grenades, it is not because of an instantiation of their form, as in the Platonic view, that some are bulging and some pliant, but by a material necessity which depends on space filling solids. As Kepler knew, the theme of close packing was treated in three disciplinary domains, mathematics, philosophy, and the art workshop. He certainly wants to keep the dialogue open, and indeed the three smaller woodcuts used in this part of the Nive Six Angula have more than a superficial resemblance with some of the technical aids exposed in Albrecht Dürer Euclidean Review of 1525. These plates were a form of useful knowledge for painters, goldsmiths, surveyors, and so on. Apart from being inscribed in a lofty gift economy within the imperial court, the Nive Six Angula was target targeting the same audience. And Dürer's lovers also knew that his 1514 engraving of Saint Jerome in his study inscribed the study of close packing in a luminous refraction of the round panes, but with a mistake. The recurrent geometrical pattern is shown vertically on the wall, but horizontally on the window. Dürer might have committed a projection error, an artistic license, or a playful riddle, but Kepler surely must have enjoyed in all of these ways. Still, the main theme we have followed in the Nive Six Angula is taxonomy. In the parenthetical set on close packing, which occupies half of the treatise in what is perhaps the ultimate joke, feathered radi triggered the incessant question in Kepler's treatment, why do we always end up with a six-sided shape? Both in its intellectual curiosity and theoretical range, this query finds a counterpart in the collection of Greek problems that has been attributed to Aristotle, and in particular in Book 16, which is part of a mathematical series of problems whose dissemination remains difficult to understand. Uh, at the outset, one of these problems concerns floating bubbles, and the problem begins, why are bubbles hemispherical? The answer is not clear cut, as in Kepler, and it entails a procedure of mathematical abstraction that is not different from the snowflake in Kepler's work. In general, uh, we see Kepler avoiding simple solution, although at least in one case, the division of plants into five compartments for the reception of the seed. He does insist that it is correct to see in such regularity 
a numerical rationality and a consideration of their own beauty. Uh, you can see hints of that in the first two um, quotations on the slide, particularly the, the confirmation of this one, confirmazione mucundissima contemplazione, so the kind of playfulness reinforcing this particular aspect of regular, uh, regular rationality. Even so, the context is not immediately clear about this self-developing progression, and it does not explicitly suggest that Kepler wants his readers to recognize the argument as deriving from Pythagoreans and Platonists, for whom numbers have a causal force and directly determine spatial dimensions. This is a good example of how Kepler in the Nive Six Angula builds an arsenal of geometric proofs out of epistemic playfulness. With a view that a further stage of the investigation, these topological arguments will indeed amount to a demonstration in the sense of the apodeixis used by Papus of Alexandria. And it might also lead to a proper natural teleology. It is because Kepler feels he has piled up sufficient examples of ontological layering, biological complexity, and natural entanglements that he can finally approach the basic objection to his reasoning, namely, third quotation in the slides, that where there is order, there is no space for chance. Ubi ordo, ubi nullus casus, etc. Kepler, uh, um, so. Kepler's reply goes to the very core of the Nive Six Angula, explaining that the facultas formatrix or formative principle, which he invoked often in the treatise and stems from Galenic embryology, does not only fulfill higher finality, but is also in the habit of playing, as it is shown in mineral extraction. And this will be the meaning of the last quotation of today, which is this. Uh, why do we say uh, nature plays, dum dicimus naturam ludere? Well, there are many examples, uh, multis fossilium exempli spatet. It, it is manifest from several examples in, in, uh, of mineral extraction. So two features stand out of this discussion of Kepler's essay on crystallography. The first has to do with being well-equipped as opposed to ill-equipped, not only with the interpretive of instrumental tools, but also with the personal skills required by the competitive practices of courtly exchange. To be sure, the necessity of acquiring one's toolbox underlines the continuity in patronage and prestige. From the Mysterium to the Nivis Ex Angula, little has changed in Kepler's negotiation with his readers geographically or indeed epistemically. His projects are meant to be eagerly sustained by mathematical and artisanal communities. He also continues to use late humanist ideals of performativity, trusting scribal intimacy as a counterpart of printed standardization and navigating, as we would say, in the same network. Kepler was not the first to openly conflate theories and mathematical jokes. Of course, the most obvious predecessor was Nicholas of Cusa, who perhaps facilitated the acceptance of his analogical geometry within the Roman Curia with ample use of insider jokes. But what is really innovative uh, is that he trusts practitioners. Not only does he defer to gem cutters as witnesses of natural octahedra as a most exquisite form of perfection found in diamonds, but he also ends the Nive Six Angula with a reference to a panel he saw in the royal stables at Dresden, which was inlaid with rhomboid figures, he writes, as if in a flower. From these acquaintances comes the second feature. Kepler orchestrates a substantial enlargement of the late Renaissance concept of jokes of nature, which we know primarily uh, out of Paula Finland's study in the early 1990s, that align spectacles of science call from various domains for the sake of elite patrons and their audiences. Most of our discussions concentrate on anamorphic art of geology or geology, and they do not trespass the boundaries of the history of collections. But I argue natural paradoxes have extra value as epistemological tools and their appeal is not exhausted either by monstrosity or imitation or any other expansion of nature's metamorphic potentials. In other words, a standard narrative connects playfulness with extravagant diversity, making it ancillary to natural magic. As such, it also explains the relegation of these objects and puzzles as fraud or trivia during the 18th century where they could have disrupted the taxonomy of what men, was meant to be proper science. The Nive Six Angular, on the other hand, is showing major flaws in this account. Snowflakes are a topological laboratory of order and mathematical ethos that is meant to be an alternative to the courtly fascination with atomism, which to the eyes of Kepler is extremely dangerous, particularly in Prague. 
By the same token, promoting this natural object to an epistemic status is not the same as elevating a leftover specimen from a cabinet of curiosity, but it actually means opening a new window on natural philosophy, which concurs with the rehabilitation of practical geometry to a mastery of the physical space and to the reshaping of mathesis. The same holds true uh, for the participatory energy of artisans and virtuosi. And I hope uh, I, I leave you with this uh, uh, window open if it has any value. And uh, it was very uh, nice to be with you for this hour. And yeah, thank you very much.